afraid you have the fog going in the background and we have <laughs> Doug Kellner in front. Uh, Doug, your work derives mainly from the Frankfurt School, or at least it comes out of that tradition. Uh, what elements of their thinking do you find exciting and useful today? Well, the Frankfurt School was really the first group of theorists that discovered the importance of mass culture and mass communications that in the U.S. and the advanced capitalist countries, but also the communist world and fascist Germany that they were refugees from, mass culture is becoming an important form of social integration, that things like films and comic books and broadcasting were vehicles of ideology. And in their classic study of the culture industries and dialectic of enlightenment, Adorno and Horkheimer were the first to show that social theory, to conceptualize how society works, needs to have a theory of mass culture and mass communications. Moreover, that this has political ramifications. They were concerned with the integration of the working class in advanced capitalist societies and how it was that the proletariat, which was supposed to be the revolutionary, most progressive force in society in the classical Marxist theory, had been integrated into a conservative social force, and mass culture was one of the explanations for that, that people were deceived, indoctrinated, mystified by mass culture, that mass culture was a form of ideology that served the interests of the ruling class and was thus a new mode of social control. So that was the starting point for my work in popular culture. And I still think today that they're right that mass culture is an important component of contemporary capitalist societies that to understand the organization of our societies, we need to understand the role of mass culture and mass communication. Where I came to disagree with them, and I think I was influenced here by the British cultural studies tradition, was this notion that mass culture was a, uni uni a monolithic uh, form of domination and ideology, that there was, it was a one-dimensional form in which it was totally a vehicle for conservative ideology. Following the approach of the cultural studies tradition that was influenced by the Italian theory, theorist Antonio Gramsci, they developed a hegemony force, a hegemony model of popular culture, that each society is a sort of matrix of conflicting groups and forces and subcultures, that the ruling class, for instance, is divided into class sectors. Sometimes a conservative sector, sometimes a liberal sector, becomes the hegemonic, the dominant force in the society, but it is always battling opposing forces that there are new social movements, that there are oppositional groups, there's individuals fighting for a counter-hegemony, be it socialists or feminists or black or brown liberationists, that society is a matrix of struggle. And in this way, I move to the position that popular culture itself is a contested terrain, that the different groups who are fighting for dominance in society have ideologies. Their ideologies are articulated in popular culture. And so in the United States, for instance, you have liberals producing liberal texts in popular culture, conservatives producing conservative ones, right-wingers producing ultra-right texts, feminists, socialists, different groups are producing texts that reflect, that reproduce their ideology. Okay. Um, in terms of practice, there's a lot of academics, of course, that theorize about cultural studies. Uh, what's the link between the theorization of cultural studies and the practice? Well, for people that are radicals, that are progressives in some way, it shouldn't be enough simply to analyze, to criticize popular culture. That's an important part of the tasks of developing alternatives to the current society, showing what's wrong with the society and developing alternatives, which can be intellectual, that can be sort of utopian blueprints for an alternative society. But then the question comes how to realize these alternatives. What kind of politics do we need to engage in to change society? And here, I think that people that are studying and criticizing popular culture should be aware, one, of the power of culture in society, the force, the impact the culture has on individuals, and thus the importance of developing a cultural politics. So 
So people that are engaged in the study of popular culture who want social transformation should engage in the practice of cultural politics, be it producing alternative video or music or film or dance or whatever media one is uh, involved in, or as I'm involved in, developing alternative information resources. I've been involved for about 11 years in Austin, Texas in producing a weekly public affairs television program called Alternative Views, where we literally try to have people on that will articulate the views that are excluded from the mainstream media in the United States, be they representatives from the third world countries like Nicaragua or Cuba or El Salvador, people in the liberation movement, be they feminists, anti-nuclear advocates like Helen Caldicott, the American atheist uh, theorist uh, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, be they blacks, Chicanos, gays, Native Americans, any number of social groups are excluded from the mainstream uh, media. So our television project is a attempt to get these voices into the political debate, to allow them to articulate their alternative views. And I think the left needs to see the importance of providing alternative information, taking advantage of the new technologies, as well as the print media that most of us initially have uh, worked in. Too much of the left, it seems to me, is print-oriented thinking, and is indeed sometimes technophobic, thinking that television and video and film is a debased form of uh, production, that image somehow, video, is intrinsically manipulative, conservative, reactionary in its effects, and thus merely limiting their activity to writing or speaking or demonstrating, etc. Whereas if it's the case that most of the people get their views of the world, their information from the television, then it seems obvious that the left should intervene in the media that people are most involved with and present alternatives to have left interventions, feminine, feminist interventions, in the dominant media in a society to develop a left cultural politics and a left media politics. This has been the theoretical and practical agenda that I've been working with for 10 or 15 years now. The creation of a left cultural politics uh, oftentimes tends to be stigmatized because of different theoretical interests within the left. Postmodernism, for example, being an important theory that the left has embraced. Uh, well, there's two questions. One is how, to what extent postmodernist theory illuminates uh, the trends in cultural studies? And the other one is, of course, is to what extent is contemporary culture postmodern? Right. The main insight of postmodern theory is that our contemporary society is an image producing and proliferating society. This was one of Baudrillard's early insights that radical semiurgy, the production, the proliferation of images, characterizes the very essence, as it were, of our society. It used to be the case that in modernity on Baudrillard's model, industrial production was what the society was all about, the production of uh, commodities, buying, selling, consumption, etc. But even consumption, Baudrillard saw, was more and more structured around image, what he called sign value. You bought a product, you exhibited a product for its prestige. Moreover, the media do nothing but produce images. So we have these images machines that are saturating our culture with images. This is creating new modes of experience, new consciousness, in which literacy, the word, verbal discursive culture is on the decline and image culture is on the rise. So this is one essential insight of postmodern theory that helps us understand our current situation. I think the middle Baudrillard also had many insights into simulation, hyperreality, the way that models and codes are coming to constitute our experience of the world. For instance, Reagan being a simulated president. He's not a real president. He doesn't really know politics. He acts. He follows a script. There's a model of what the president should be, look like, etc., that he acts out on cue with his uh, teleprompter, etc. So he's basically simulating the presidency. And more and more of our culture is being determined by these simulation models. So these are some real insights that postmodern theory uh, has. 
what they do is erase very often such things as ideology, class, oppression, manipulation, etc. They're more of a descriptive theory about images and codes and hyperreality and less of a critical theory the way that, say, Marxism and feminism and other uh, theories are that analyze the ideologies, the messages that are being conveyed. A lot of postmodern theory is sort of formalist in its analysis, is technologically determinist, that the images themselves are autonomous and I would argue false. They're part of a system of production that is still capitalist corporations, advertising agencies, media industries, what Adorno and Horkheimer called the culture industries that are producing these images that are still, in my opinion, serving the interests of a dominant class that controls the media and that reflects their interests, their views of the world, that are ideology. So it just seems to me demented that the postmodernists want to throw ideology out as a category to throw out content analysis as if only the form of images were what is at stake in uh, popular culture uh, studies. I would advocate a dialectical approach where we analyze the new forms of image, the traits, the quality of postmodern uh, image uh, production, but we also see what the uh, content, the messages, the effects of these things are. To a certain extent, uh, postmodern theory follows McLuhan, that the media is the message, the formal effects of a media have the determinative role in the impact of the media on uh, culture. This seems half right. There's definitely some insight in there, but it seems to me that the content, the ideology, the messages are still extremely important. And I think actually semiotics gives us a better handle on this, where there are signifiers, signifieds, there's codes, there's systems of image uh, production, and it seems that approach is still extremely useful. So I think postmodern theory can be useful in illuminating aspects of our image environment, our media society, but to take it as the end all and be all, to go the extreme POMO route, seems to me absolutely uh, disabling for critical analysis of the media and its effects. Plus, in Baudrillard's model at least, it leads to cynicism and pessimism. Baudrillard decries all forms of alternative media practice. He doesn't see the possibility of intervening within a media system or a popular culture system with genuine alternatives. Everything just gets absorbed in uh, pure image proliferation. So alternative cultural politics or media production would be part of the problem or just more of the same rather than presenting any um, alternative. So this seems to me a sort of politically cynical and disabling move on the part of Baudrillard and other postmodernists. Okay, go ahead. Don't worry about I'll take a little going. drink. Yeah, that was wonderful. The other question is going to be mainly, and this is just off the top of my head, uh, cultural studies. The importance of cultural studies right now, why is it that in the late 80s and early 90s we have the emergence of these this new discipline and the different kind of intellectual traditions that, that uh, make up this new discipline as well. I think, right, I think it's not accidental that postmodern theory and cultural studies both emerged in the 1980s as widespread models for the an analysis of popular culture. It's precisely the proliferation of forms of popular culture, of the images of popular culture, the increased popularity of film, of popular music, of uh, television, of any number of forms of culture in the 1980s that the postmodernists have been describing that makes it imperative to study academically and to valorize politically these different forms of culture. There has also been, and this is another postmodern point, an erosion of the distinction between high and low culture, so-called, in the academy, that English departments are no longer just teaching English and the canon and the great works, but are also looking at alternative marginal literatures, excluded voices, different types of oppositional literature and text, and the forms of popular culture. Now, cultural studies, as it, as it developed in England in the Birmingham School, made this broad range of popular culture the terrain of study. From the beginning, they attacked 
the distinction between high and low culture. They valorized the importance of popular culture in people's lives and for left political uh, projects in the way that I discussed um, earlier. Moreover, they gave critical methods of analyzing popular culture, ideology critique, Freudian uh, symbol criticism, feminism as a perspective and critical method for analyzing uh, popular culture that are of extreme importance today. So cultural studies, both as sort of a project of study as it developed in uh, England uh, as a methodology to criticize and analyze popular culture and popular cult, um, cultural studies as a political project involved with critiques and analyses of the hegemonic, the dominant forms of culture in a society that also studied the marginal subcultures, the cultures of resistance that would form the possibility of what Gromsky called a counter-hegemony, strikes me also as an extremely important political intervention within the uh, field of the study of uh, popular uh, culture. Indeed, this obviously connects with what I was talking about earlier, the need to have uh, alternative cultural and political interventions as well as just uh, cultural um, analyses. And so therefore, I think the cultural studies offers a nice, a very uh, productive political project. Now, what I'm worried about in terms of the appropriation of cultural studies, particularly in the United States, I can't speak for Canada, although one could imagine that this could also be a product problem here, and that is a depoliticized version of cultural studies, where in the academy, in the universities in the United States, they're perfectly willing today to study any form of popular culture, to have cultural studies programs that mostly, by the way, get into uh, English departments and use the forms of uh, literary criticism to study television, film, popular music, etc. And they may even be willing to use Marxist ideology critique, structuralism, post-structuralism, psychoanalysis, but they abstract the study of culture from this political project that was part of the Birmingham School of British Cultural Studies, and basically they're eliminating Gromsky from the field of cultural studies because it was Gromsky who analyzed culture in terms of a theory of hegemony, the ways that forms of popular culture produced the hegemony of a given class, group, or sex, or race in a given uh, society that was also concerned with counter-hegemony, with oppositional forms of culture that would produce social alternatives and social transformation. There's a real danger that this type of political project and analysis and critique will be erased from the field of cultural studies as it's institutionalized in the United States and perhaps Canada, which now brings us to where we are, and that is the Popular Culture uh, Conference. In this sense, cultural studies, sort of defanged of its political project, is no different, or is little different, let us say, than the kinds of studies of popular culture by the Popular Culture Association, which is willing to study each and every and any form of popular culture to make it an academically respectable discipline. And this is the positive moment of the popular cultural uh, tradition here. This PCA uh, convention has been an important force in intervening within American uh, academic scenes to make the study of popular culture um, viable. But there's a serious problem in their approach to popular culture, and that is it tends, in many of its practitioners, to be too empiricist and too anti or even hostile to theory, where it just simply describes and even celebrates the forms of popular culture, be it uh, quilting or comic books or horror films or popular literature or whatever, that these things are viewed uncritically. Now, the cultural studies, even in its depoliticized form, will be more theoretical than the popular culture uh, tradition of the PCA. So in that sense, even a depoliticized um, cultural studies in the U.S. or Canada would be an advancement in terms of the theoretical and critical project over the PCA. But both a depoliticized cultural studies and the sort of 
often a political popular culture association approach will miss, will lose out on this political project that British cultural studies was initially involved in and thus would be a regression behind uh, that model. So if I had to valorize any sort of approach to popular culture, I guess it would be the Gromskyan approach as was incorporated in the uh, British uh, popular culture, uh, British cultural studies um, tradition. On the other hand, in terms of describing my own work, I would describe it as more eclectic than following any particular line, be it the critical theorists, be it Gromsky, be it the um, uh, Birmingham uh, School. For instance, my book, uh, Camera Politica, that I co-authored with Michael Ryan was a study of Hollywood film from the 1960s to the present that was relating the major trends and tendencies and blockbusters of Hollywood film to the new social movements to the political struggle in the United States, to the historical uh, issues and turmoils of the time. The project was to combine the sort of historical materialist approach to history with the Frankfurt approach to ideology critique to feminism, post-structuralism, and the new critical uh, methods that are being developed to show how one could use all of these different uh, methods, uh, different schools to analyze popular culture. And this is the position I would take today, that ultimately a multi-perspectival approach to popular culture is the richest. Any single take on popular culture is going to have, as Paul DeMond would say, its blindness and its insight. That doing a pure feminist reading is going to really illuminate gender. Doing a psychoanalytic reading is going to illuminate certain aspects of the unconscious and sexuality and other topics that psychoanalysis is good at. Doing a Marxist ideology critique is going to illuminate other things. But each one of these methods taken in and of itself will have its limitations, its blindnesses, and that to do a more multi-dimensional mode of cultural analysis and critique, you need a variety of methods. Now, this doesn't necessarily lead to pluralism and eclecticism because different projects, diff analyzing different texts or having different sorts of ideals or goals or projects would require using different of these uh, theories and excluding um, um, other ones. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, but you stop talking. Yeah. Okay. If, uh, well, I don't know if this one you want to deal with or not, but uh, the, you know, there was a, a sort of, some sort of clash a few years back in the UN uh, which focused on communications uh, where third world countries, and what it made me think of it was you're, you're talking about alternative sort of uh, right. things for uh, Minorities of the U.S., where you had uh, you had the third world talking about a conspiracy by the communicators, uh, and frankly, they were fed up with it. And they weren't going to deal with it, and it led to a crisis in the U.N. where U.S. was holding back uh, payments and so forth. Based right. on, and they sort of flattened that out. And I guess the question becomes, uh, uh, you know, that's not going to go away. Like the the uh, builders of these images and the message uh, are going to continue to be uh, the networks. Right. Uh, how do you, do you see in the big picture any change in that, or is that going to become more us than them? What's going to happen in that field of, of, in the ether? Okay, my, I, Joe, I think the final thing that I would like to talk about is the need to integrate not only a multi-perspectival approach to the theory, to the critique of popular culture, but also to merge studies in popular culture analysis with mass communication. Now, one of the great grounding insights of the Frankfurt School was that mass more the forms of popular culture rather than a system of mass cultural production, the system of political economy, the modes of cultural imperialism in which products that are produced in the United States and the advertising agencies, the networks, the media uh, conglomerates are disseminated all over the world and form a type of cultural imperialism, particularly U.S. Uh, cultural imperialism. So I think that to f analyze the full range of the production and effects of culture, you have to go to a mass communication approach, too. 
And this brings in a lot of political issues that I think are essential to a political analysis of mass culture and mass communications. For instance, um, in the United Nations several years ago, uh, UNESCO tried to oppose this um, cultural imperialism by the uh, U.S. so that countries could control their satellite communications, their uh, national uh, media networks so that a certain percentage of uh, products would be controlled by the people in the country so that, for instance, Canada or France would produce a certain percentage of their television or radio uh, or film uh, production so you wouldn't have your market flooded with the products from the United States. Now, the United States fought this. They wanted open skies, open markets, no quota as a entry ticket for cultural imperialism and domination because UNESCO was dominated by countries that wanted to block this form of U.S cultural imperialism. The U.S. tried to defund um, UNESCO to threaten the United Nations that, well, if you pursue these policies, we're not going to give you any uh, money. So there's all kinds of uh, international geopolitical issue in the politics of communication. And far too often, people that do pop, uh, popular culture studies uh, neglect these kinds of issues that I think are inseparable from the analysis and theory of uh, popular culture, that it's absolutely essential to ground one's theories and analyses of popular culture in broader theories of uh, mass communication that talk about the production, the distribution, and the reception of um, uh, popular culture. One final point, we haven't really got into another key insight of the Birmingham School, the decoding. This is something else that needs to be studied, the way people use and, um, and, and uh, can self valorize the products of uh, popular culture. There's a tendency in the Frankfurt School to have too much of a manipulation uh, model in which you simply analyze the messages, the ideologies, and you assume the audience is indoctrinated, that it simply passively reproduces the ideas, the forms of behavior that are disseminated through the media um, industry, whereas the possibility of cultural resistance on the form of the audience, on behalf of the audience, the possibility of the decoding of the um, media product in a way against the intentions of the uh, producers of this thing is an important insight that again goes back to the Birmingham School. At least I first got this position from the very early Stuart Hall uh, paper on encoding, decoding. So this is an important uh, element of a critical approach to cultural studies, but you can go too far in this sort of celebrations of the use and gratifications of uh, popular uh, culture, and you can lo use your, lose your critical thrust. Certain uh, theorists, I think, have gone too far in that direction, overreacting against the uh, Frankfurt School and over-exaggerating the extent to which individuals um, can decode in their own um, autonomous ways that makes popular culture thus more uh, harmless and just simply more fun and uh, less uh, potent than it was in some of these uh, other theories. You mentioned fun and pleasure the importance of popular culture as being the site of fun and pleasure. I mean, the, the power of popular culture is indeed that, is it not? Right, but, uh, you know, wife beating may be fun, fascism is uh, fun, torture and murder may be fun for uh, sadists. That valorizing popular culture as good per se, simply because it produces pleasure, I think is the worst approach uh, to popular culture. The one Back, goes back to an early bourgeois theorist by this guy Stevenson of uses, gratifications, pleasures of popular culture. You need to distinguish between uh, sort of good and bad uh, pleasures. Pleasures that uh, encode certain ideologies that lead to sadomasochistic, sexist, racist uh, behavior, or pleasures um, in gratifications of eroticism, pleasure in community, in solidarity, 
in individual self-valorization, et cetera, that seems to be sort of progressive, emancipatory kinds of um, uh, pleasures. I, th I think one needs to distinguish and discriminate between the messages, the pleasures of uh, popular culture. And quite frankly, you need a normative theory and a political theory to be able to make these kinds of uh, discriminations. And I think it's an important part of the critical project, at least, to uh, do this. Oftentimes, the postmodernists simply embrace this notion of jouissance and, and pleasure. And right. And, and, and Without ma and wanting to erase all of these uh, distinctions, which I would insist we still need to make to, to have a critical posture towards uh, popular culture, but we have to elucidate and defend our um, criteria of uh, critique that also should be seen as provisional, subject to negotiation, transformation, and change as our experiences and societies change. It's not that there's any universal you know, criteria of taste or uh, political rectitude or anything.